the whole system demonstrator program. This was massive. It was a huge, huge challenge to do this program, to recruit the number of patients needed, which was 6,000 across the three sites, 283 G 38 GP practices, that was um, a challenge of its own, um, simply because of the GP culture and the environment that they work and the way that they work. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. They were <coughs> integral to whole system demonstrator and recruiting them was a challenge. So I think we should celebrate this really. I know there's a bit of um, negativity around it, but nothing on this size has been done in the world about this technology. And everybody knows that if we're going to cope with the tsunami of people that's coming along, the same old, same old, the demographic time bomb, everything we've just saw on the last slide, then you know we're going to need technology to help us. So this trial was really important in proving the case. I have to say, in its defence, it generated more data than you could ever believe. But that data is really, really rich. So the evaluation team have been wading through it since I don't know when, with everybody on their case to get some deliverables out. And the first set of headlines you can see there are about telehealth. Quite interesting, isn't it? 45% mortality. Emergency admissions, well, I think I'd expect that, and I'd expect all those other things to go down too, if you get it right. But what I was really, really pleased with as well is that these outcomes here confirm what we found in the Kent pilot. So for us, that confirms our direction of travel. We're right, we've got the model right, what, everything that we've done is positive, um, a few clangers, but we've learnt about those and we're not going to repeat those, which is the name of the game. And so I think for demonstrator, what we should take out of this is, yes, we don't have all the nitty gritty. Do we need the nitty gritty? Do we need a bit of risk, a bit of gut reaction? And do we need this that says, yeah, this is what we found, there's some detail to come, but these are the headlines. It works. You've got to get it right, but it works. So let's use that in a positive way. This now says we can go and get on. We don't need to be sat around. This should be sufficient for everybody to take this step because I'll take you back three sentences. Without technology, we are not going to manage what is coming along. And that's the first tsunami. I have another theory on a different tsunami, and that one starts at five with school children and poor health. But that's a whole different subject, and we can go on that one another day. <coughs> so what does it tell us? It tells us if we get the right people with the right technology, we can help them to help themselves. <coughs> and by helping themselves, they will use services more appropriately. They will interact better. Um, we've seen that, reduced hospital admissions, reduced length of stay. That's good for the economy, good for the patient, and good for their carers. Really interestingly, it does bust that myth about isolation, doesn't it? Lots of people will say, oh no, technology, no, no. That means they'll have a bit of kit and I won't see them and they won't see me and that's not right. That was a huge risk for us in the Kent pilot too, what would happen. We didn't find that at all. We found people embrace this technology and we found the same in whole system demonstrator. People have Sky, they have mobile phones, they have iPads, they have everything. We must not do them the injustice of underestimating their ability to embrace technology and to use it to their advantage. What's one of the problems at the moment? 
There's no market stimulation, so that doesn't generate demand, which doesn't bring the price down, so it's difficult to invest. Proving the return on investment case is very difficult. In Kent, we spent a million pounds. We bought a server, 250 pieces of kit, and a project team. That was me, my shadow, and an administrator at the start of it. And no, I'm not on a big fat salary. It's just very expensive. But that was 2004, the infrastructure was expensive. So what we need to do now is to generate the volume business to start bringing it down, which will help justify and enable more people to use this technology, privately or statutory. And we need to work with industry to understand what the right price point is. You know, for me, it's going to be a lease model. I'd like a lease model, and I'd like that to be as flexible as my mobile phone model, please. Thank you very much. When it arrives, that'll be great. In fact, I probably want it on my mobile phone if I'm 15, 20, 30, even 40. The next key message is it doesn't bring the change. You know, this isn't a box of tricks that you give to somebody and then miraculously things get better. You have to change the services, the infrastructure behind it. And most importantly, you have to change hearts and minds. And I will say to you that will be one of your biggest <coughs> challenges, getting people to embrace this openly, honestly, come out of their work silos, work together to drive this forward. You really do need service transformation. So you should not think of technology as an additive. Where does it fit into this? Technology is just part of it. If you were assessing somebody for <coughs> occupational therapy equipment, it's part of it. Technology will be part of it. That's how we need to think of it. Normalization, not an additive. As I said before, the patients really quite like it. They enjoy it, they enjoy the independence, <coughs> the empowerment it gives them, and the release from carer burden. Let's not forget that. I know there's some telecarers in the audience, um, but what's the principles? If you don't understand telehealth, what are the principles? Well, it is just about moving data, really, and better quality data. People are at home, they're rested, they're relaxed. You get more consistent data so you can look at subtle changes. You can make the intervention. It does embed the principles of self-management. We had one chap uh, on the Kent pilot, rang me up one day. Hazel, Hazel, I'm really sorry. My numbers are really bad. I'm really, really sorry. I said, that's OK. What, what's the problem? He said, my figures are really high today, but I know why. It was such a beautiful day. I love my garden. I spent too long in the garden yesterday, so I overcooked it. I'm OK. Patient power. Embedded learning. He didn't call an ambulance. He knew what the cause and effect was. Great stuff. Without that transformation in the patient, we probably would have had an interaction with services. And that brings with it a whole roll of costs and other interactions and outputs. So this stuff really does work. You get all this data, but, you know, it doesn't take long. Our community matrons triage in the morning for an hour. Look at their telehealth patients. That's about 70 people on caseload. And they look at that, and then they decide whether their plan for the day is most appropriate, whether they do need to put in a call or a visit or change medication or do something. So this data is really rich and we should invest time in that. This is the new way of working. You need to think about how you change your day. So that's all very well and good, isn't it? Absolutely great stuff. This stuff is not rocket science. It really, really works. But there's that really, really thorny issue, isn't there, when you're talking about service transformation? <coughs> Will it replace me? Will it affect my job and role? These are real questions. We found them in the Kemp pilot. We found them in Whole System Demonstrator. <coughs> I'll bet your bottom dollar you're going to find them because they're absolutely valid questions. 
So you can see the sort of things that people say. Um, and actually, it doesn't do any of that. It doesn't replace the clinician. It's a tool in the bag. It gives them something to be more effective with. It's not a computer at all. It's a piece of kit. Everyone logs on email. They can log on telehealth. It's really not very difficult. So here's the success criteria. Um, this is exactly the same from the Kemp pilot from whole system demonstrator. Now to me, like the results, that is the big tick in the box that says, go do it. You know, there's, there's enough here. But this slide here looks nice and easy, doesn't it? You know, um, target the correct patients. Everyone will be looking at top tier Kaiser Permonte. Yep. Complex, multi, long term conditions, high users of services. Great. <coughs> Our metering caseload starts um, just below top of tier two. So we're looking at the transients. Really works there too. If you get too far into level three, you're into end of life care and everybody's got every service going in anyway, so sometimes you don't find that the technology is going to deliver you any benefits. So think about that. You're going to have a session on risk stratification. Out of that will shake out your telehealth users, absolutely. So um, you'll find them. I'd like to make an interesting point here. Whole system demonstrator was absolutely positive that there will be a huge overlap between telehealth and telecare users. Our experience in Kent was there wasn't. The experience out of WSD was, uh, actually, there isn't. So that's quite interesting. But if you ask me, I actually say, I think there is. And the reason why we didn't find them is data sets, data quality. Where are these people? They might be pitching up at A&E, they might never see a GP. They might be sat in their own home, isolated, um, just getting carted off to hospital. So sometimes the people aren't where you think they are. So you need to think about that when you're looking for your case finding. Um, your risk stratification will really help you if you're pulling in all your different data sets, your history, your social care and your community data. You've really got to get the right staff. It's back to this hearts and minds stuff. Um, you know, people need to be reassured it's not going to take over their job. It's going to help them. You know, if you've got any digipens working in the area, people probably find that after a period of time that they help them with some of their work. Same principle. It's just a different tool to do your <coughs> job. So. The hearts and minds battle will be a real, real challenge and you might want to invest some time thinking about how you're going to do that. It is a tool in the way we will manage this tsunami that's coming along. We have to change, as Amanda was saying, you know, we have to do things differently and this is just one way of doing things differently, but it should be a golden thread that runs through the care pathways, not an additive, a golden thread. So my message to you is it's a really exciting place to be. The biggest, biggest payback I got when I started telehealth was watching that patient become more independent, have better control and a better quality of life. That beats anything. I, you know, it is a great feeling when somebody <coughs> changes completely to be in a much better place. So we can do this and we can do it for lots of people. So please go experience that for yourselves. You do in different aspects of your work, but go and experience it with telehealth because it is very, very powerful. So don't press that pause button. <coughs> Game's on. I'll leave it with you.